I now welcome our honorable chief guest Dr. Ramaswamy Balasubramaniam Garu to address the gathering. Namaste. Pujya Swami Bodhamayanan ji, Adyaksh Maharaj Hyderabad Ashram. Swami Atmanishtanan ji, Secretary Ramakrishna Mission K3. Monks of the Ramakrishna Order, devotees, friends. As I was sitting there and listening to Pujya Swami Bodhamayanan ji describe the Ramakrishna Martin mission and the extraordinary work that's been happening for the last 125 years. It suddenly struck me that you really cannot celebrate Ramakrishna mission with a one day evening function. Actually, we have been celebrating the very purpose of humanity and life itself for the last 125 years. How can you encapsulate it into a two-hour program across the country even? And it is something like it's an everyday celebration of compassion. It's everyday celebration of the very existence of mankind. It's possibly an everyday celebration of the expression of divinity itself. To capture it over a year-long celebration is only a small attempt to tell the world what the world needs to hear today. You know, I was remembering, is it even fair to limit the work and idea of, of the Holy Trio just for India, though 269 centers, more than 200 centers must be in India itself, a substantial number in the United States, how fair is it to even say that this is an Indian organization? It may look improper for me to say this today, but I think it's a global organization in a real sense. It's an organization of mankind itself. And surprisingly, my introduction to this extraordinary organization was a pleasant accident. And thankfully, I had that accident very early in life. I was a young man of 17. And the picture of Swami Vivekananda was just a picture in a college which I studied in the city of Bangalore. And at 17, you know how every young man's hormones are playing around. And having studied in a completely boys' school, I finally thought redemption is on hand. I'm entering into a co-education college. And that college was reputed to be very strict. And the principal of the college, the founder of the college, who had just laid down office as principal, had a very simple rule. The rule was so simple and strict that boys could not talk to girls in the college. And I got to know after I joined that college. And yet very intelligently, we had a staircase, I remember. It's very vivid in my eyes because that picture was the beginning of possibly the sowing of the seed of change. There were two sides of the staircase. Boys had to walk on one side, the girls had to walk on one side. And despite the best efforts of the principal, the landing was common. And so he must have thought, this is one place where these boys will have mischief. So to sort of control as possibly, he put a big picture of Swami Vivekananda there, the Hindu monk of India. So that man was so ingenuous, we thought even that time we felt somebody is watching us. And Vivekananda describes it in his works that Swamiji and his message, even if it were to enter through the smallest pore of our bodies, can create havoc in a positive and constructive way. So my introduction to Swamiji was just that. And there are three words, Hindu, monk, and India, of India. It didn't mean much, much to me. And like any average 17-year-old, my life's ambition was to follow my siblings abroad. 
and a typical Indian middle class family with very ordinary crass aspirations of just becoming a doctor or an engineer. We don't even become, we are made into one by our families, I suppose. And then go abroad. I was no different and I thought I would get into an IIT, but IIT did not think like me, so they didn't take me. So finally, just chose what came my way and I chose a college in Bangalore. And this is where I believe the unseen extraordinary presence and hand, I can't even call them a trio because in my, me, in my thinking and understanding, you can't really separate a powerful idea. Maybe it is represented as Bhagwan Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, and Mother Sharda Devi for us to assimilate and understand three powerful different ways of reaching out to them. And to make our appreciation of those philosophies easier, it's just, they just manifest as three different forces for us to decipher out. That is my way of looking at it. And I was here going to the college on the first day and happily ragged so badly. I, those days ragging was there. I don't even know if our children today know what ragging is. There was no law against ragging. So we were, the seniors had fun at our expense in a very polite way. But what it did to me was took away the courage to go back to that college the next day. But coming from a typical middle class family and our mothers, as any mother is, has this uncanny way of discovering that you're up to some mischief. By looking at us, they can tell us. So if I did not go to college, if I did not leave home, I'm sure my mother would have figured it out. So I went, I went very nearly till the college, lost the courage because there's a police constable standing outside. I thought, oh my God, yesterday's ragging was bad. Today this ragging is going to be so bad that they have a constable watching over. So I just came back, but on the way, in Bangalore, in Basangudi, very just a few hundred meters away from this college was a Ramakrishna mission. I didn't go there in search of Vivekananda. I definitely did not go there in search of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa because it was just a lesson in my book sometime in fifth or sixth standard. I went there to escape that engineering college. And it was, the gates are open, green campus, like all missions are, very welcoming place. And it was very welcoming, I went inside. <clears throat> Two, three days I spent there sometime, till the afternoon they would close the gate, so we had to leave. And I would go home and tell my mother half day class, new, newly opened to half day class. After three, four days of this, the brahmachari then, Swami Chidanji was the president I think at that, that time, discovered that this young man is just loitering around. Maybe he is going to steal their lovely fruit trees. Those of you go to Bangalore, when you go to see the Holy Mother's Rock, there are a lot of fruit trees there. He must have thought I've come there to steal a few fruits. So he started keeping a close eye on me. Either that or he thought one more addition to our fraternity. So he's potential applicant. So whatever it was, he was closely watching me to escape that monk's, that uh, brahmachari's gaze I went into the library at the entrance of the ashram. I never went there to discover Vivekananda. I think Vivekananda has got a way of discovering us, whether we like it or not. And the next two months, I'm not even sure I understand. I don't even think I understand much even today. I read the complete works of Swami Vivekananda, which came in eight volumes those days. I just read it. I don't think I understood it. But two books, extracts of them in two small forms, His Call to the Nation and To the Youth of India, I think is still running riot inside my brains. And I find hundreds and hundreds of ways in which these get expressed. And as I unpack my thoughts, I realize Ramakrishna mission itself is discovering hundred ways each day to express the Holy Trinity's manifestation on this earth. And they come out in so many different ways and we just see them as programs, health, education, or just support for people. I have been privileged. 
that I've had some of the finest monks of the order mentor, guide, and encourage me on. And what do they get in return? So beautifully encapsulated in one sentence by somebody who was, who I see as my guru, Swami Sureshanji. One day, I still remember, when I used to go to the Ramakrishna mission, and I'm giving these incidents not because they happened to me, and I'm sure every one of you in this room would have a different experience of this kind, but to show that the Ramakrishna mission is not an institution. To reduce it to just describing it as an organization is reductionist. To just experience it as the very presence of divinity is a different experience. Swami Suresha Anji is possibly the most hardcore Advaitin I have seen. That even as Adhyaksha of the Ashram, you would hardly be in the prayer hall. And I would challenge him and say, what is this? Because to me, it was just not acceptable. And he one day told me, he would come. I would go at all odd hours to the ashram. And for me, going to the ashram was not for any spiritual succor from him. It was more to get the free food, which I didn't have to pay for, because I was a very poor NGO. And it would be available all the time. And he would, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, cook and give me. Because there would be nothing in the kitchen. He would cook. He would make coffee and say, you will never drink a better coffee because this is specially blessed, not by a monk, but by an expert coffee maker, he would say. The love that he showed is possibly an expression of what Ramakrishna Paramahamsa lived. And we may not be able to understand and deconstruct these powerful messages, but these expressions of the divinity that these monks keep manifesting for all of us to live from, learn from, and imitate, I think is a contribution of the order which none of us can even understand and assimilate. So it's different packages that come to all of us. And as I sit back and ask myself, is there some one thing we can say that comes to us from the order or from the monks and their guidance? Is it just the independence that we got because several young people were inspired by Swamiji? Is it the reconstruction that India is seeing now, the resurgence of an India that we are seeing, which a few weeks ago in one of the conclaves, the Honorable Prime Minister said, India's moment has come. And is that moment the final climax of the expression of Swamiji's life and message that he told us for the last 125 years of the mission that we are all understanding? Is it just the outside development that we see and calling it India's moment or something far deeper? Can we really unpack the rising of a new India? Can we even understand it even? For that, I think we need to understand something of the India that we had, possibly. The India that Swami Vivekananda did not have during his time. And the India that he wanted us to build. And the campaign for India that he gave us is something that each one of us have to live. And that's the resurgence, possibly, Swamiji wanted. And the resurgence is not in materialistic terms. It's not the extraordinary airport that cities like Hyderabad and Bangalore can boast of. It is not the thousands and thousands of schools that we have today, or it is not that every Indian house has a toilet today. Those are all ex external manifestations. How seva can manifest, the jagathitha that we can all demonstrate. But is there something more subtle that we're all going through? For that, you need to understand and I'm going to use very economic terms to describe, because that's all we can all relate to. And I'm not an expert to talk about the spirituality of Swamiji. But I'm going to give a small expression. And if you look at India, uh, an English-based economic historian, and that's all the Westerners can measure India from. And that's a limitation, and I would like to use their instrument to describe it. Angus Madison was his name. And he started capturing what during the crisis, economic crisis, he no longer, he passed away a few years ago. But one of the tasks he was given was, can we learn from some country in the world by understanding if they successfully grew? I use this example to talk about something else. And his discovery was the only country in the world which grew year after year, decade after decade, century after century for 1600 continuous years was this holy land of Bharat this extraordinary civilization, which actually had powerful ideas. And look at it, looking back at our history, 
It is not the economic growth I'm worried about. 38% of global GDP was controlled by India. We were even sailing our ships across the ocean even before Archimedes of Hoover said, oh, things can float. We discovered algebra, trigonometry, metallurgy, and all that much before others were talking about it. But more importantly, what we discovered was the power of the human spirit. What we discovered and what Vivekananda so powerfully articulated was not just that we were masters of external nature as we saw it, but we had discovered the enormous science of mastering internal nature itself. And this unique combination, this very unique civilizational contribution to the world, that it is not about the powerful sciences and the quantum technologies which we are also on the path of today, but also looking deep inside us and discovering that strength, that power, that potential to build not just a great nation, but to have the courage to say, Vasudai Vakutumbakam. What a powerful concept it is. And today we are talking about it in G20, where all 85% of the global economy that's going to be controlled is going to come to this holy land of ours. And they're given a very simple mantra, one earth, one family, one future. And this cannot but be, in my opinion, the peak expression of what Guru Maharaj said. When he said, harmony, harmony of religions, harmony of thought, harmony of philosophies, harmony of every way we can think of, the integration, the powerful concepts, and this being captured so succinctly in a very appealable slogan by the Honorable PM, which I think is what we can time to tell the world, and that is what our time has come, the rising new India to tell, that we have discovered that Jagat Hita is meaningless. The blind pursuit of consumerism is self-defeating. The Jagat Hita without the Atmano Mukshartam is an inadequate, incomplete expression of human development. And the model that the Ramakrishna Mission demonstrates this is complete package, the comprehensiveness, this building of human capital, not just physically, as much as you might have a yoga class in some Ramakrishna order somewhere, where physically the hospitals that they run, the care that they give to the, some of the anathalias that, that they may run, the way Swami Vivekananda expressed, the physical service, is as important as the intellectual service that they do which is contributing to the great country that we're all building. The maybe 1,400 schools, if I remember last in India itself, the thousands and thousands of children are coming out of these extraordinary institutions in the spirit of Tyaga and Seva, the national ideals that Vivekananda gave. Look at, look at the extraordinary power of these messages manifesting itself, building human capital physically, in the Sharirik Seva that Swamiji spoke about, intellectually the Baudik Seva and more importantly today in a world torn by negation, in a world torn by conflict, in a world torn by human greed and possession, the emotional maturity that each of us have to di disclose and demonstrate, the sense of contentment, satisfaction, the feeling of happiness or happiness can never capture the cushy that we can describe in our culture and finally all this not for just external happiness but for that inner joy that Satchidananda that we all been spoken to from childhood and this integration of philosophies being the foundation for this rising new India and that is what the Ramakrishna mission does and in its own quiet way if at all we can complain I keep doing this complaint to all the monks I meet they are so quiet that they hardly have any imitators. Imitation is actually a good form of flattery. And many of us, finding inspiration from the order, have imitated the Vivekananda Youth Movement and all such organizations across this country. A lot of people run, thankfully, get its mentorship and guidance from several monks. And I still remember and how they manifest in so quiet ways when I had set up this policy think tank called Gram, I wasn't sure that anybody would support. Supporting service activities is very easy. People can see a hospital, can see the school, all that I have done. But suddenly talking about building a cultural 
building a new India, resurgent India on the cultural civilizational foundations, building public policy on that thought, it looked very outlandish. And Swami Prabhudanji at the Vedanta Center in, Southern, in uh, Northern California, I was explaining to him, and he was very sick those days. He, he couldn't even get up from his chair. With great difficulty he walked, and three minutes later he came in. And he pressed something in my hand. And I was wondering, what is this man who is so tired, is so sick. I, we do not even know how long he will live, how unfair it is for me, I allowed him to even get up. And Swamiji laughed at me and said, when you started Vivekananda Youth Movement, you came here. And I had arranged for you to give a speech. And look at, I had never given a speech in my life. And forget a speech with a biksha bowl in your hand. It takes a lot of courage to do that in front of Americans. So he said, just talk. Just talk about what Swamiji did to you and the rest will be okay, he said. I spoke. People collected some money. And those days, I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking nearly 40 years ago. And later that evening during dinner, Prabhudanji had told me, $10,000 is collected. Look how well you speak. And Swamiji told me like that, I actually believed it. Don't clap for me. I actually believed it. I thought, oh my God, I must be a really good speaker. And Prabhudanji put a masala also. It was as though Vivekananda was dancing on your tongue. I thought, oh my God, I am now really somebody. And then several years later, I forget his name, Robert, somebody was he's passed away. He told me, I will tell you a secret. Prabhudanji was feeling very bad that you will feel disappointed. So only $800 got collected. He made us all give the remaining 9200 so we gave you 10000 So it was not my talking, but it was the love and the encouragement that Vivekananda was demonstrating through people like Prabhudanji. And that, fast forwarding 30 years later, stuffing $500 in my hand. He said, when you started that organization, I could afford that much. This new organization, you are more capable now, but I can only afford this much. Please start it with my blessings. This is the enormous, unseen, unspoken foundation through thousands of people that the order lays. And that is a real rising of the new India. It is not the manifestation of these airports, schools, etc but building people. So when Swamiji said man making in character building, it is what centers like human excellence does. How can I describe this? So for me, the only proof is that the fact that the new India is rising is a demonstration of the work of the Ramakrishna Martin mission. It's a privilege, it's an honor, and to me, it's a blessing that I am fortunate to continue to receive in plenty, even today. It's just that I always feel that I was privileged that my Diksha Guru Swami Achalanji, though not of the order, but uh, of but Swami Atishwaranji's disciple who lived with him and somebody who shaped my thinking and my understanding. He gave me such blind conviction, a conviction which I have experienced. And I want to end this with two stories which can defy rational explanations because I was a rationalist seeking answers. I would challenge Swami Achalanji whenever he would sit with me and explain to me Drigdashya Viveka or Viveka Chodamani and then say, all this is very simple if you read the gospel. He would give a very simple, simplified way of ending every lesson. Two experiences I want to narrate, which defy human explanation, but demonstrate the experience of the power of the Holy Trio. Every time I would feel frustrated that there was no support for the work I was doing, I would feel like giving up. I would go to Achalanji and say, what should I do now? You people all inspired me. I would go fight like a child with him in Suresh and say, why did you all do this to us? Now we are all lost. We can't go back to regular work. But we don't find support. And Achalanji used to tell me, I don't know how many of you have visited the Ramakrishna Institute of Moral and Spiritual Education, what we call RIMSE, or we used to call it Vedanta College in Mysore. 
above is the prayer hall below the prayer hall is a cellar where very few people go except close devotees many of us go just go to meditate and achalan ji would say i have no answer but i can give you a powerful mantra don't ask me explanations if you have faith go try it you would say whenever i am confused i cry to the old man he find some answer so i can only tell you that mantra go cry to the old man and if he find some answer you have it and i can tell you whenever i have cried to the old man i have been heard so much so that i become arrogant now that i will continue to demand through my tears or whatever you call it prayer meditation you can give it different names and that old man is there to listen so these are not stories these are things which in their own ways are demonstrated to us and i want to end it with what happened to me in the early days building a hospital in a forest with hardly any support except the faith conviction and the mentorship that swami sureshan ji was giving me i was one day sitting old tattered banian a little white dhoti having started to build the hospital but having no money now and every friday i would sit calculating what will be the daily wages i have to pay on saturday evening to the workers it is a very painful thing and my only expression was on a saturday morning go to mysore by bus tell suresh anji what is my total and that man somehow would collect something and give me keep my energy alive he would never allow me to go back empty handed whatever he had people come and do namaskar pranams and give something that's all he also had he would never touch the orders money it was always to be his money and one friday evening i decided if achala anji says cry to the old man let me test it out i will not go ask suresh anji today i will not ask anybody money if that man is really powerful let money come to me the arrogance of bhakti is also something which you have to experience and sitting there suddenly one i don't i don't you know if those cars exist now on maruti 800 car came and stopped near the gate it's a old hardly any entrance nothing and one man came out running a youngster maybe he was mid, mid late 20s or early 30s and said somebody told me there's a doctor here is there anybody then he looked at me and how in our thinking india is a very funny country if you think somebody is qualified and somebody is knowledgeable we'll talk in english what a tragedy he looked at me and he said this man dirty dhoti torn banian then he started talking in tamil and said and this kannada territory is i heard there's a doctor here is there anybody then i looked at him and in tamil i answered i am the doctor that fellow couldn't believe it then to convince him i spoke in english i told him i am the doctor i can tell what is the wrong what is wrong then he said me my wife and my child were going to the jungle lodges for a holiday those days there was no credit card no all that no google pay nothing we lost our way and we kept driving and we didn't know it's getting dark now my son wanted to pass urine so he just stopped and he went near some bushes and after that his whole body is scratching so somebody told us there's a doctor here we wanted to show him to you some insect had bitten him we don't tell all the secrets as doctors we'll never say what is wrong we say oh i'll cure you and i did the same magic gave him an antihistaminic tablet i actually gave him an injection i think and the boy was much better this man was so happy and satisfied he said what are you doing here you are saying you are doctor but i look like a mason at that time i said i we are building a hospital he said oh thank you so much and he went back to the car came back to me and he said i i have come for a holiday what i thought i have extra 2650 rupees is what i will give you please take don't clap the story is not over it the next day do you know what the total of the wages i had to pay was 2647 rupees 3 rupees was my bus charge back to mysore go tell the story to suresh anji this is the ramkrishna order this is the power of a rising new india if the foundations are all the four for the people who seek jnana guru maharaj can find a way out for those who seek work and karma and i'm privileged that today i've been fortunate to be 
part of Mission Karma Yogi, where we are hoping that this spirit of Swami Vivekananda, this spirit of Tyaga and Seva gets imbibed by every single Indian civil servant who will continue this journey of building a resurgent India, this rising new India, the Prime Minister keeps talking, building a team India for a new India. For those who just can only understand bhakti, just looking at the Holy Mother, her simpli simplistic understanding of entire spiritual expression to so just that extraordinary love she's got for us where you can go to her and ask for anything and it will be done and putting all of this together and just looking at it and understanding Swamiji from a different perspective the Raja Yoga that he talks about whatever we want this like a vessel a funny vessel where depending on the person who puts his hand inside the product comes out and that is the extraordinary vessel of the Ramakrishna order. So 125 years is no time at all. This is an institution for eternity because what they do is for eternity. As long as human beings live and with all the problems we create for ourselves, we'll be reminded by these monks that the life's purpose is something else. That cultural identity that this country is getting back that sense of spiritual responsibility that we have to show to the world and to be that mother, the Jagat Guru that Swami Vivekananda spoke about, that resplendent mother that we got to put back on the throne, our work has just begun. Namaskar.